Hello and welcome to another one of our uh, wonderful events. My name is Ben from our bookshop in Tring. Um, hello to uh, firstly our audience um, because you're sitting there looking rather splendid. Um, massive hello to Beth who is um, uh, the topic of our discussion today and um, and Jamie who's just a legend in, our, in, in, in literary circles around our area. So Jamie thank you for turning up. I'm going to disappear shortly. Just so you know, um, I will be coming back uh, and asking all the questions that you will be putting to, uh, to the wonderful Beth and Jane, indeed. So um, use the Q&A function. You'll see it along the bottom of the screen. And um, if you want to put any comments in the chat as well, I'm sure uh, we'll pick those up as well. So, but without further ado, uh, can I hand over to the wonderful Jamie Fury? Thank you very much, Ben. Um, yeah, as Ben said, we are delighted and privileged this evening to be joined by Beth O'Leary and we're delighted that she's chosen to spend her book launch evening with uh, our bookshop in Tring. Um, so before we do anything else I think that everyone who has a glass if you have one should just raise it and to congratulate Beth. Wait on the, you uh, see my glass it's massive. What, what I've done <laughs> is I've all book launches have like dodgy red wine so I've got the dodgy red wine oh. there. And, oh, I wish uh, I the dodgy red wine now you're right they do always and it's got or or alternatively warm white wine that's the yes. other book launch classic. <laughs> One of the two. And so, yeah, just everyone raise a glass, celebrate the launch of the road trip. Oh, um, good to everyone. <laughs> and congratulations. Um, so obviously everyone on the on the um, on the event will know Beth work probably from the flat share and the switch. Tonight, obviously, we're going to be talking about the new book, The Road Trip, which I have a copy here, although it's the it's the proof. It's Ooh, the proof. My copy. And I, uh, I finished it earlier in the week and it's a really good fun enjoyable read I think you know particularly at the moment it's going to lift everyone's spirits very very nicely um, and it kind of tells a complicated nuanced slightly messy love story between Dylan and uh, Addy that kind of plays out in in multiple locations but centrally in a, a small car driving to a wedding in Scotland so I thought before we go into anything else Beth do you want to just introduce the book talk to us about it obviously most people here will will have not read it unless they're a super quick reader and started this morning. So <laughs> over to you. Just tell us all about tell us all about the road trip. Oh, thank you. So yeah, the road trip. Um, it begins with two exes, Addie and Dylan, crashing cars on their way to a mutual friend's wedding, um, and only one of the cars is still sort of functioning after the crash. So they and their passengers all end up piling into one car for the long, very awkward journey up to rural Scotland, where the wedding is. Um, and kind of interspersed with that story is um, Dylan and Addie's first love story, really, which is, you know, kind of when they first met, which um, starts in France and it's sort of this sunny holiday romance. Um, so you've got kind of two love stories about one couple woven, woven together, if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, I think it'd be interesting when we, when we start, because we spoke about this yesterday before the event, we had a bit of a chat about it, because it turns out we've both written road trip road books trip. and they both ended up in Scotland. So firstly, why did you want to write a road trip? Because knowing from personal experience, they're a bit of a pain because you've got all these things around distance and location and where the hell people are and how long it takes like them to get to certain places. It's logistical, isn't it? It's yeah, logistical. It's a, it's a bit um, of a nightmare. I am also a very nervous driver and I get car sick so it's a really good question <laughs> why I decided to write a road trip um but I think I just I'd had the idea absolutely like years ago I think maybe even before the flat share had a publisher I had this idea of two exes crashing cars and having to share a vehicle and I just I love that um kind of romance genre trope of force proximity like you know like getting stuck in a lift or um mm. and a car is just such a like sort of airless perfect setting for tension I think um, and I really wanted to write a kind of a really unglamorous British road trip because I feel like so often the ones we see are sort of you imagine like speeding down wide roads in America with the sun shining and like the top of the car down and I wanted to write a sort of grey motorways service stations the aircon's not working you know because there's just so much humour there I think um, and I love like taking a situation which is sort of rife for humour and 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 playing with it but yeah you're right it is a challenge to write a, like half a book kind of all set in a car and mm. um I did find myself thinking like 
we need to get them out of this <laughs> we need to get out of this car sometimes because this they're they're like so cramped in and there's five people in a mini so it's um literally like they're like shoulder to shoulder and is it one of the one of the new minis or one of the old minis <laughs> good question <laughs> It so that's is a big difference. Over, yeah, I've, I've kept the exact details of the mini fairly vague. Okay. <laughs> so that um, if anyone who's really, really knowledgeable about cars <laughs> has any questions, then I can uh, say it's whichever model uh, suits, suits best. <laughs> and I, I remember I sort of got I got really panicked about this because when I did the same thing, I I said it in a camper van, and um, uh, a bit more. Nice. Yeah, well, but when the cover came in, it had one of the old Volkswagen camper vans on it. And I was like, oh, no, I haven't done that at all. It's a newer camper van. So I ended up like, going through and seeing, seeing if I could change it. And eventually I was just like, you know, I can't be bothered to do this. So I just emailed the editor and see if I can get away with it. So I was just like, in a camper van. And so give us an idea of how much time you spent on Google Maps basically doing this. <laughs> Did you write it in lockdown? Then? Did you, was the, a lot of the writing so I going started lockdown? it before lockdown, but yeah, I was working on, um, yeah, still working on the novel during lockdown. Um, and I, it's so weird actually to think that when I, I remember first pitching this idea to my publisher and, and us talking about like, oh yeah, bro, you know, a road trip, that's so sort of like, we've all been there that long cramped car journey and it's it's looked like quite relatable because it's not a particularly glamorous road trip and actually now I feel like a long road trip with friends kind of it's become almost like nostalgic or like, oh yeah, totally, yeah. But like you know you kind of think oh like it's been such a long time since I've like had my best friend in the car with me and eating minstrels and just taking a long drive but you know those 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 aren't like familiar things anymore which is which was weird because that kind of happened halfway through writing the book um but yes much time on google maps at the beginning i actually pretty much always had it open um and sometimes sometimes we just have like you know just a little stretch of motorway as inspiration just yeah to remind me and get me in the get me in the mood <laughs> um but i i was really good at the beginning with keeping track of exactly where they were and when um, because I was like, this is going to be a nightmare later if I don't do this, because I'm going to be trying to find out like exactly how far they could have got between these two times. And so at the beginning, I was really good, wrote it all down, like had a little map view and then just it just went. And by the end, it was like that I'd lost it completely. And then in one of my edits, I, uh, I was like, right, I've got to tackle the like the journey bit and um, notice that they'd actually gone backwards. At one point, I was like, "No, <laughs> they're meant to be going forwards." <laughs> even yeah. even by their standards, that was bad. <laughs> and and you find yourself thinking of things that can happen to cars that delay the action or slow things down. Yeah. I remember I wrote I wrote a tire blowout, and then someone I work with said, "You know, on the cover of the book, it's the wrong tire that's flat." And I was like, "Cheers for telling me," and really <laughs> picked up on that one. And and obviously contributing to the sort of emerging canon of literature set in service stations um which is <laughs> which i think is sorry um so what, what are the other particular challenges with writing that i was thinking in terms of did you have to try and balance the kind of arc and trajectory of a love story with the idea of the journey and where they were going mm. and then you had this other kind of love story plot as you say in there as well so there's a lot of moving parts yeah and and the car off often really it really lends itself to super intense conversation um which was great in some ways and and you know everyone in that car has well everyone except Rodney one of the characters has history with each other so it's Addie Dylan uh Dylan's best friend uh Addie's sister and then a random guy who posted on the Facebook group saying that he needed a lift um mm. that's the contents of the car but there's a lot of intensity there and so the car was really helpful in that sense because it kind of it, it things boiled over very easily you know you were kind of cramped in this hot space the car radio like was quite fun to play with you know like when the, the, that song comes on that makes you think of that person and um but yeah I, I I kind of had to make sure and and actually I chose to write um I didn't I, I thought about writing it chronologically so it swaps between then and now and I thought about going writing then and then writing now um but I wanted to get that like you say the sort of the beats right I guess and and mm. to make sure that when you've had a really really intense moment in the car you get a bit of that relief that you need at that point in the narrative and maybe that comes from switching times and just stepping out of the car for a moment and being in 
you know a, a party somewhere or, or something else that just gives you that change of perspective and pace um so I ended up writing it sort of alternately if that makes sense um uh, just to make sure that I got that and and I mean also um Rodney the, the random character was yeah. very helpful for, for diffusing the tension in the car I was gonna say we'll get on to characters I, I, I suppose we should talk about Dylan and Addy first because they are as you say in the car is Dylan and Addy her sister Deb uh, and then Marcus and Rodney who both both perform slightly different roles in the book both of them are quite controversial in their own way but let's talk about Dylan and Addy and kind of set the scene for us what's their what's their story going into this you said they there are a couple apart and they've crashed into each other yeah so um they Dylan is kind of he's a dreamer he's a poet he's um uh, had a very privileged life um and he sort of so yeah he's he's kind of puts his foot in it quite a lot in a <laughs> in like a sort of and he he knows it um and Addie is much more she's a very practical person she's just a really good-hearted kind of um very strong woman um and very pragmatic um and so they come from very different kind of viewpoints on the world and um that's probably more the case in in the then narrative which is when they which kind of shows us when we first when they first meet so it was nice I got to write cause one of my favorite um things to write is that meet cute like the mm. moment when two characters first sort of lay eyes on each other and I got to write two about one couple in this book because you get the moment when the cars crash so the moment when they realize oh my god that's my ex in that car um which was just a joy to write because there's you know there's so much history between them that we're not we don't know a lot about yet but um it's there and it's simmering under the surface and there's still that real attraction between them um and then I also got to write their meet cute the very first time that they met which um and I I, I loved I had this idea that they would hear each other before they saw each other so um when they meet Addie is a caretaker in this fancy villa where um, Dylan's most supposed to be with his family um, but only he has turned up um, for various reasons and so she can hear kind of this one person moving around in the house upstairs but she is trying to piece together sort of who he is and um, I really love just just giving that like making making us wait just a little bit and 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 for the two of them to kind of collide in that time um, and uh, yeah, so I got I got a double meet you, which was bonus for me. <laughs> yeah, and and you sort of set them really, <clears throat> as you say, on the the sort of opposite sides of the tracks to each other. There's they come from very different backgrounds, and that always also comes out through their families as well. Like Addie's family is really warm and kind and friendly, and when later in the book you get to experience those people in their house, you're like, I would feel comfortable in that house, and then you experience Dylan's, and you think, I would never ever want to go there in my life. But also, as you say, kind of, he comes from pr the kind of, I, I, I thought about this when I was reading it, it was like, the only people I've ever known who think they could be a poet for a job generally come from a bit of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I thought, and I wanted, I really, I, I wanted, I think, so I think if you're doing a, a kind of second chance romance and you're, you're looking at whether people might be able to, you know, whether there's hope for a couple that have broken up before, you really need to show that something has has changed in a really sort of meaningful way between them or or that or that there was a reason that they broke up that you can understand and think they can move forward from and and so mm. I liked the idea that actually that first time they met they started on quite uneven footing and you know Addie was there as as a caretaker and Dylan was there as a guest and you know that kind of set this slight tone of of and Addie is very conscious of the kind of power balance between them and and she doesn't want to give too much of herself away because she feels, you know, very vulnerable doing that. And um, and I wanted them to that to be part of their journey between sort of then and now that they're the kind of meeting much more as equals in in the now story. Um, and there's less of that sort of odd tension. And and you know, Dylan's are just a bit more self-aware, I think. Um, but it, it was it was hard because I wanted the then characters, the the, the then version of Addie to sort of sound. Of course, she needed to sound like Addie and, and she needed to sound like herself in the present, but also to show growth. So mm. quite a challenge to have, I guess, two voices for one character, um, you know, just a couple of years apart. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is interesting because you see them at these at these various points in their life and this big event has happened in the middle and you sort of unpack that and learn about it as, as you're going along. But there's always this kind of in one 
story there's this bubbling love story and then the other way it kind of it starts with a great moment of tech i just remember that bit when they crash into each other and they realize who it is and like like i've been on trains before and i've looked across the aisle and been like oh god it's my ex and like there's this like moment of like supreme panic um <laughs> for no reason like you spent years with this person you probably get on fine but yeah. like in the moment you're like oh my god <laughs> And you, and, you know, Dylan at first says like, it's, you know, when you think about someone enough, you see them everywhere. And it is like that after you've broken up with someone, isn't it? That you yeah. kind of you're like, oh, that's them. And then you're like, oh no, that's just, that's like an old, that's an old woman. That's not them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're, uh, and I think that's done really, really well because you really get that sense oh, of, you. that sense of like shock. And um, also in the car, uh, the, the people I feel we really need to talk about, uh, one is Marcus, who is a, Mm. They, we were talking about him we called him a so-and-so which is a really kind term for him but yeah. he, he's a bit of a one um what was it writing such kind of because you've got Dylan and Ellie who are both kind of at their core nice people yeah. and then you've got Marcus who and he goes on perhaps the biggest up and down journey throughout the book and you learn different yeah, things about right. him and his background but he's also a bit of a rotter what kind of what was it like writing that character was it kind of fun to write that kind of character or did you feel like you wanted to challenge something with him or yeah um it was really it was really fun and it was really difficult he was the character that I, I knew even kind of quite early on this character is going to be fine-tuned and fine-tuned until the final edit because he has to be awful <laughs> mm. but I wanted him to be awful and but also I wanted to explore whether that kind of character who could be the villain and kind of is the villain you know in some ways whether they whether I could write a, a forgivable villain uh, mm. I guess or and you know whether the reader chooses to forgive him I think it's up for debate like there are in the book not everybody does and you know some people do and some people don't and um yeah I think and and I I, I liked I wanted to play with sort of this that you, you know that sort of person who despite yourself you're like god he is quite charming isn't he like he's awful and like why am I laughing at what he's saying because that's actually a really awful thing to say but kind of yeah. is a bit funny you know like that that sort of character everybody knows someone like that don't they yeah my, yeah <laughs> I personally found myself going through phases with him where I started out being like oh god he's awful and then you find something out and you think, oh, well, there's a reason for the awfulness. So maybe I'll just be a bit more sympathetic towards it. And then you find out something else. And you're like, oh, no, I was right the first time. Some people, regardless of circumstances, are just are just duff people. Mm -hmm. And then so I think he's a really interesting character because so much of the tension in the car, whether it's like something as simple as he doesn't like what's on the radio or <laughs> something more profound, like his role in the other relationships of the people around him, like he's the kind of the trigger point for so yeah, much. Yeah, he's almost the key, isn't he? And he was sort of the key to the novel, I think, for me. And and I, I yeah, I think he 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 was always going to kind of. I, I actually initially wrote him a little too far. I think I, I I made I kind of reined him back in a little bit, and um, and I never I didn't want him to be super clear cut, and it was it was fun and challenging for me, like and interesting for me to write a kind of a character who you know we weren't sure about and mm. and he, he he wasn't sort of the the good guy or the bad guy he's sort of just the guy who you think oh yeah he's still he's still around and maybe maybe I'll give him another chance you know that guy <laughs> yeah he sort of can't can't get away from him and then we have um we have Rodney um and he's a a real I I, I described him as like real comic relief because everyone else in the car, there's tension, there's there's history, as you say, there's they they're all feeding off each other in some way or another, and they kind of all as soon as the the collision happens, they all dread the fact that those are the people they've been thrown into contact with. Then you have this one guy who always seems to be in the middle seat of the car, <laughs> <laughs> offering people flapjacks. And, yeah. Uh, so talk to us about Rodney. What, what role you know, that's does Rodney so funny play? that you said that he's always in the middle seat. In my head, I sort of imagine Rodney in the middle seat at all times. Really, really like crammed in, like nowhere like, to move. Ease, ease up. <laughs> yeah, um, won't say anything. Yeah, Rodney was like, I remember a friend once said to me, and this was in the context of, of living with people actually, said that you always need a lightning rod, that you need that one person in the house that 
everyone can get annoyed with and direct all of the little niggles <laughs> towards that one person. Yep. Um, and at various points, Rodney is a very useful sort of like like <laughs> Oh, we've got a little cat. Hello. <laughs> he's, a, he's actually a huge cat. Um, <laughs> but he might make an appearance in a minute. He did last time. My my pup is passed out, exhausted. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> Um, so she, luckily, because she's usually very interested in cats. Um, sorry, I was. What was I saying? I've got distracted by your car. Oh, lightning rod. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So and and yeah, I needed someone in the car to just like lighten the tension. As I was saying, like th there was so much kind of history and 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 also Rodney served quite a useful purpose in that he sometimes asked the question that we needed asking as a reader mm. because he was almost like almost a bit like the reader in the car, although I'm sure all our readers are much cooler than, than Rodney. Um, but, you know, he was the person that didn't know what was going on and and could occasionally, you know, say something that would expose a situation or, you know, just move things on because he doesn't realise that the tension, he is like fairly tone deaf to tension, <laughs> which, um, yeah, proves helpful sometimes. And he's found himself there because he answered a thing on a Facebook group, does anybody need a lift? And that's how he's got himself into the car. He, so he yes. So he has no idea of the history, he has no idea of the context, and he just sits there asking difficult questions. But then his, his role, uh, uh, as people who read the book will know, his role develops as the story develops. So he, you know, he's less of a kind of, less of a patsy, but still kind of a, a, a genuine figure of fun. I also thought, was it deliberate calling him Rodney? Because that's kind of a name of that kind of person. Like, I the wonder the history that goes with Rodney, particularly in Britain. Yeah, I hadn't even <laughs> thought that. Maybe not consciously, but yeah. <laughs> because I thought that. I thought you know, Rodney's a very, you know, Rodney U X Y Z. You could put anything after it, and, uh, <laughs> and he certainly fills that role. Fills that role in the car, and, and he's yeah, he's very interesting. And then then finally we've got we've got Deb. And because it is such a tight cast of characters, it feels like we, we should give them all a bit of airtime because Deb is kind of the very strong female character, very much got Addie's back and obviously has got it in for kind of Dylan and Marcus somewhat. Yeah, I mean, I, I always felt, so when I was deciding who to put in the car, I sort of think, I mean, with exes, who is more like invested in hating your ex than like your closest person so for Abby mm. that's her sister um you know and for Dylan it's his his dysfunctional best friend um but I really I wanted to put those two people who like it's almost it's it's you know your best friend is feels more strongly about your ex being a dickhead than you do you know <laughs> that's kind of like their role isn't it so I thought that was that was such an easy way to kind of up the tension um and I, I love Deb's character I think um I really I really enjoyed writing a really strong sister bond um and and kind of showing and, and I think you were saying about kind of Marcus goes through the most up and down journey and I think everybody in the book does change dramatically from then to now but Deb I think she changes in some really key ways, like she changes her mind about something really big, but she ultimately is kind of the only one that knows who she is mm. from the beginning. And the other characters are sort of floundering around in that like haze of their, you know, first love and not really knowing themselves. And, and she's much more grounded um, and, uh, and that kind of stays throughout. So I, I kind of liked her being also a bit of a, um, a steadier figure when we've got all these sort of dreamy people that are that are changing their minds all the time yeah and you know there's obviously there's her well, there's a couple of big events that involve her in the book when she sets her mind to something she sets her mind to it and, and that's kind of what she's gonna do yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and like I really I really loved how her that her and Addie like you say they really have each other's back but also there's almost a kind of unquestioning love there I, 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 and like you say about their family that the warmth in their family um you know, it, it's Addie sort of takes for granted that not takes for granted, but like knows she can rely on her family in a way that Dylan just has never had. Um, and there's a moment where where, um, you know, somebody one of Dylan's friends says to Addie, you make your own family, don't you? Um, of this friendship group, that's this very tight friendship group that Dylan's in. And, and she kind of thinks about her family and is like, that's that's just never how she's thought about family, because that's not what it is for her. Um, because she's always had these like really tight bonds with her with her family. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. Um, 
part of the book that I mean I mentioned Dylan's kind of he had a privileged upbringing but a difficult one in that you know he doesn't get on with his father his brother is kind of close to him but also slightly estranged from the family so there's all these things that make his life his life difficult even while he has the kind of privilege to pursue poetry and and all these all these other different things and, and swan off to France and that kind of stuff and um, so speaking of France I just wanted to touch on this before we before we go on to other other books you've done I, in the in the proof copy there's a, there's kind of a letter at the beginning and um and there's, there's you were on holiday when you thought of this and you thought there was something really romantic about the part of France you're in how how does like you sort of mentioned earlier but how does writing a book in the kind of the beauty of Provence with the lavender fields and, and all the rest of it transform into a book about uh, English A roads um, yeah. and settings there how does that kind of was it did you start with the kind of I'm gonna I really want to write something because I know I know that feeling where you you really want to write something in a particular setting but then it ch slightly changes into something else because you realize that's a potentially better place for the book mm. yeah so I, I as I was saying had the had the car crash idea first and I knew I wanted that to be a British road trip I didn't want to kind of take them across anywhere else I, I I just I don't know why I just like that was part of what excited me about the road trip idea um but it never it just felt like you know when an idea feels like half an idea and you know you know that there's something missing but you don't know what it is mm. um and I really felt that with this idea for a long time and and then when I was in Provence and I and I'm it's really unusual for me to kind of find a setting that I want to set I'm not really a setting first sort of writer generally okay, like my yeah. characters tend to um come before the location but this place just I, I don't know what it was I felt that buzzy feeling when you know like I feel a story coming I feel a story coming and I wanted to it was so romantic I wanted to write a love story kind of in those vineyards and in that low heat and I'd, I'd never written a kind of holiday romance before and it just really appealed to me um and yeah it just whilst I was thinking on the road trip I, idea that has kind of been brewing in the back of my head I, I kind of thought hang on like I just I found it really interesting that exes they've been in love before so it, it, once I kind of thought that I thought well then they've kind of got two love stories and maybe I could intertwine them and mm. maybe one of them could be in France and um and so it sort of is kind of almost two stories but but they obviously kind of in mesh and and um there are things that you find out in the then that inform the now and vice versa so you're sort of piecing together exactly what what happened with Dylan and Addy and, and kind of trying to work out if they've got another shot I guess yeah that's really interesting to say like you're, you're so you feel like you're always led by characters because I suppose like in my head I was if I when I was thinking beforehand I was like well a couple of your books have got really strong like setting vibes to them so like flat share has got a really like a big yeah. concept around property and then the switch has kind of got this house sort of thing but but you feel like you're always led by character then yeah I guess I mean I don't I don't think of the the place first it kind yeah. of comes later I mean the the flat share I did um I knew I wanted the, the I guess the flat idea came first and then yeah. the characters came very shortly after they're kind of I immediately was like you know who would who would be willing to share a one bed flat with somebody who they'd never met uh, and the characters kind of came next and um the switch the two locations so it's that's a grandmother and a granddaughter to so swap locations my my second book um and th the locations in there I knew I wanted to have London but um I did toy with like whereabouts in the world should Eileen the grandmother be so it wasn't and the setting became very important later you know mm. Yorkshire I love Yorkshire it's where my husband's from and, and where his family live um and so it became very important but I didn't know right away that it was going to be there it, it and not until I'd sort of met met Eileen <laughs> that makes me sound a bit yeah. mad met, but that's sort of sometimes how it feels isn't it when a character yeah, yeah. turns up <laughs> and are you like I'm slightly similar there do you borrow place and settings from like people around you so I every single thing I write seems to have some aspect of it somehow ends up in Suffolk because it's where my wife's oh. family are from and I spend a lot of time there my last book had and it tends to be if I go on a holiday that will eventually appear in a book and it's not for like mm -hmm. tax purposes it's just because <laughs> I, I kind of borrow that are you the same that you you go somewhere or you experience the place it's and you end up thinking I'm going to write about it 
often usually like Provence is really the only time when I've consciously done it I think because usually things creep in and you kind of have never thought I mean there's a really so a really pivotal scene in the flat share happens in Brighton and I had been to Brighton maybe about six months before I wrote that scene um and hadn't hadn't at all thought that I was gonna I, I, while, while I was there I hadn't been looking around thinking this would be a wonderful place for that scene to happen um but somehow when I was reaching in that moment for where they'd go there it was because I'd you know been there a few months before and yeah I think you never know like as a writer I think you were always storing things on you just like tucking them away and you never know when you might need them I think so yeah I think I used too many of them up in my first book because it was 24 chapters that had to be 24 different things so I just used all the locations I had at once and I know <laughs> some new ones so it's like Whitstable and Croatia and all sorts of it. oh <laughs> and then you well just an excuse for more holidays then I was that. done yeah I had to go away again I, was, <laughs> I didn't know what to do at that point um oh interesting so let we, we touched a bit on on the factor then I, I think everyone will be interested to know kind of your start as a writer and we touched on it just before before we started the uh, started the event properly, how did you get started? And, and and we actually have an interesting story that we share between us is that we both wrote our first books on trains. So it'd be yeah. good for you to like, yeah. How how did it all begin for you? Yes. Yeah, so um, I've wanted to be a writer for, forever. Honestly, like I, it's it's my absolute dream job. Um, and I've always written. It's kind of almost like a bit compulsive for me. I like I just if I don't do it for a long time I don't really feel like myself um and so I'd I wrote probably I finished I think I finished four or five books before the flat share I'd been trying to get an agent since I was like 17 um and the and, and the flat share um I wrote on my commute to and from work I had a job in children's publishing and um I had an hour each way on the train which was just perfect like amount of time no like rubbish train wi-fi so no distractions um saved up and got some noise cancelling headphones which was the best thing I ever bought um I used to just press that little switch and it was like the world just disappeared and I could just step into the book um so I'm a, I'm a big fan and I still work really productively on trains <laughs> not that I've been on them much lately um but yes and the flat share um I, I sent to a, a few agents when I finished it and only one agent wanted to read past the first three chapters um uh, who is Tanner Simons, my agent now. Um, and I still remember the like total thrill of getting that email from her saying, I really enjoyed it. I'd love to meet you. And, and like how I, I can't even, I can't even express, you know, it just felt like this is the most exciting thing in the whole world <laughs> that could ever happen. Um, and yeah, so we went for coffee, we really clicked and, and um, she really helped me work on the book. Actually, it was it, she did a lot with me on the start of the flat share where it was kind of it kind of dragged it didn't really get into things quickly enough so I, I worked on it with her a little bit and then she sent it out to publishers and and kind of I I, I can't it, it was that whole time is like a euphoric blur to me now like it it, it sold um to to Quirkus in the UK within days um and then the US and then kind of I was getting these emails saying things like Dutch rights, <laughs> French rights, you know, and, and and I could I couldn't like believe it. It ha honestly hadn't occurred to me that anyone out. I mean, it was such a dream to get published at all. The idea that anyone in any other languages would be interested had literally not crossed my mind. So um, it was a whirlwind and and so exciting. And um, yeah, I, I was saying earlier because I worked in a in a uh, in publishing house um like obviously a few people knew by by the time the kind of announcement went out but in the bookseller which is like the industry uh kind of I get the industry sort of magazine isn't it and everyone gets like the morning briefing in their <laughs> inbox they had there was a sort of little article about you know Beth O'Leary sells sells the, the flat share and uh and with a little picture of me and uh, I was sat at my desk in this open plan office is like this popped up in everybody's inbox uh and it was it was I got a few people sort of sidling over being like ah, just, just just see you in the bookseller yeah. um it's just a really weird and amazing experience um and I don't I the, that first day after um the deal my, my agent had sort of said like don't tell anyone because you know these things get around and I really want to speak she really wanted to speak to all the other people that had been interested in stuff first before it sort of got out so I went into the office 
just like you know when you're just sort of pretending to type <laughs> it's yeah. like this enormous thing has happened in my life I can't <laughs> tell any of my work friends <laughs> um and in the end I did crack and tell my friend Helen um I was like can we go down to the canteen and get a tea <laughs> like, I can't hold it in any longer <laughs> I, I, I remember when it came out in the books because I'd I was sitting on I had to keep mine quiet for a, almost a year um from oh like wow acquisition to to, to wow. record it came out in the book cell and it was just my family that knew um and, and my wife and a few friends and, and most people I spoke to in the street would, would also know about it because I just told them <laughs> but I remember when it came out the flat chair and I remember reading that I said like, that's a bloody good idea for a book oh thanks <laughs> just because like I'm... all authors I like ritually read the rights announcements on the bookseller to see if someone's either had the idea I'm writing at the moment or a better one yeah the fear the fear yeah. that the, the announcement's going to be someone else has thought of your book yeah exactly yeah yeah I often get that feeling when you look at something and you're like ah oh, that's a good book I wish I'd written that and so you mentioned like the, the kind of the novels in the drawer so to speak do any of them inform your work now do you go back and borrow a character occasionally or a a bit of plot like I mean I think probably most I've yet to meet an author that doesn't have at least three that never that never and you just think back now like how hard it is writing books and you think I did three of these before oh my god I know anyone so so long (laughs) like it takes a a lot of sort of stamina to get to 90,000 words it Um, really does yeah and yes. uh, and and I actually, to be honest, there's one one of those uh, abandoned books has an idea at the heart of it that I still love, and I have repeatedly tried to make work again in a different way, and every time it doesn't quite happen. But I wouldn't be surprised if one day I work out exactly how to kind of revive it. Um, but on the whole, they are. I mean, I in no way sort of regret those books, as in I, I think mm. I learned a huge amount about writing through writing them um and I one of my sort of top things that I say when people ask like for advice about writing is is finish something because so much of the work kind of happens after you've written a first draft like for me I mean when I write my first drafts are terrible and a lot of the book forming happens in the second draft like I don't even necessarily quite know what it is it's just a mess (laughs) after the first draft and you don't really get to practice reconstructing and rebuilding a novel and until you've tried to get to the end of one um I think and and so I think I learned a huge amount about basically how to craft a book whilst Mm. doing those um but I I I, I've never reread them (laughs) I've got to say I don't know if I could do I don't know if I could bear to do that (laughs) and um, I'm also interested in the kind of phases writers go through were they you know say were were someone to read one would they recognize it as you or did you try and I remember when I did my first one I decided because I was 21 and had started university or something like that I was like I'm going to be like Brett Easton Ellis that's that's me and it wasn't me um I was terrible at it but I tried to write a whole book like that and it was terrible and if you read that now it would be completely different different world so would would people recognize you in those books oh that's a great question um so I wrote I they were YA largely I would oh, wow. say rather than and that was partly because I I was I guess I was a teenager when I was writing the, the first ones um and so the flat chair it was the first novel I'd finished in a sort of adult voice um I had there were various abandoned at 30,000 words 30 to 40,000 words is often my like abandon stage I don't know if that does yeah. that, you relate to that oh yeah totally I've got I, I, I pitched a book to my agent he really liked the idea I went away I wrote 30,000 words and I thought it was brilliant and then I got to it and I then I went back to it I said I'm really sorry I can't write any more of this because yeah. I can't see where it goes I've had that as well that <laughs> feeling where you think you feel so sure and then you realize oh no I've I've lost it I've lost the I've lost whatever you need to keep you going to 90,000 words with this with this idea (laughs) because it does like you say it takes stamina you've got to love the idea to get all that all that way to the end yeah I've just noticed we've got like 15 questions building up so I can Ben if you want I can I can pitch a couple of these in I was yeah I was I've been going through them actually they're um there's a lot of enthusiasm dare I say it but um I'll I'll throw a few in and uh, Jamie you keep um throwing yours in as well um so the longest one I, I goes to Kirsten Wallace. I'm very excited to read The Road Trip, Beth. It's a great, 
It's great to be here virtually. The flat share was one of my favorite lockdown reads. I absolutely loved it. And we've kept reading Tiff and Leon's story for much longer. Have you ever considered a sequel to any of your novels or do you feel it's important to, to, they should stand on their own? On their own? I, I never, thank you so much by the way. And I never say never on the sequel thing. Like it's, it's more that I've not thought of an idea that like feels exciting enough. I'd want to, I'd want to have that fire feeling of like, I need to tell this story and not, oh, I want to go back to those characters, I think. Um, but, and also it's, it's, it's quite hard once you've like, once your heart is a new sort of book and once you kind of, I mean, by the end of the editing process, like, like Addie and Dylan were like old friends. Like I, I knew them so well. And, but now, you know, I'm working on something new and, and it would be much harder for me to kind of, go back into their heads I think um and it's it's amazing how I think it's it's I'm fairly like I think I'm quite monogamous <laughs> with my books so once I'm kind of once I'm on the next one it would be like you know it would feel weird to go back to to the me that wrote that one um so I think yeah, emotional do you do, do you, when you say farewell to the characters at the end of the editing process um I usually I mean it helps that I tend to leave my characters in a place I'm happy to leave them because I am a big fan of a happy ending um so it's nice that you know that feels like closure for me as well I think uh in in, in that sense um and it is, it's a bit weird kind of having to when you start getting to know the new protagonists because you're like right whole new people I don't know you yet <laughs> like, <laughs> Jules asked a question about editing actually Jules Wake who's um uh, also a uh, an author sounds a great story. I can't wait to read it. I'm intrigued by how many edits you uh, you had to go through, and uh, how do you find the editing process torturous or enjoyable? I'm reading between the lines, and Jules doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> torturous or enjoyable? Yeah. Um, a great question. How many edits? Um, I wouldn't even know. So I I edit on my own for a good few months. Um, like I say, my first draft, I, I make myself read. I sit in this chair and I have it on a Kindle um, so that I cannot fiddle with it. I just have to read it. And I like, it's, it's, it's that bit's torturous. It's like, I'm, I'm literally squirming in the seat. So like, this is so bad. <laughs> um, and I make myself like write a list of all the things I want to do. And that, that edit is a long edit for me. That is basically kind of pulling the book apart, putting it back together, mm. figuring out what it is and who, usually by the end of the first draft, I figured out who the characters are um, and I know them well. And then it's kind of the second draft is making sure that they are that person consistently and throughout. Um, and then, yeah, so I edit on my own. I'm probably like, I probably do four or five drafts, just me. And then it goes to agents and editor editors and um, they help, <laughs> which is usually by that point desperately needed because I can't see the wood for the trees at all. Um, and maybe do kind of four rounds of, of structural or, or, you know, before you get to kind of the line mm. edit and then copy edits and then proofreads. So it's, yeah, it, by the time you get to the end, it's very, very different from the first draft. <laughs> it's an agonizing process, isn't it? The whole thing when you, I'm, I'm currently editing something in the moment, doing my first edit of it. And I'm like, oh my God's sake, I don't know why I bothered starting. <laughs> <laughs> the, worst, the worst case scenario, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of these interviews. This is um, close to a hundred actually in lockdown. Oh, wow. And um, there was one author, Fran Quinn, who, um, she handed it to her editor and the editor came back and said, we're going to have to lose 30,000 words. Um, and it was, oh, wow. And there was a whole chunk of storyline, which was true because it was historical fiction and she was staying true to the person's life. And uh, the, the editor correctly said, you need to yeah. lose that chunk. This is the trouble. They are always They're right. Always right. <laughs> always right. My and like, my... there's the little, that little bit at the beginning. I'm usually like for the first day, I'm quite petulant. I'm a little bit like, no, it's not. Like, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and then that fades and you're like, oh, thank God you pointed that out. That is so true. It would be so much better if I did that. My, uh, my, editor, my first book cut 15,000 words out. So we did two drafts. So I did a draft and then we reordered it chronologically. Then I did another draft. And then he was like, right, it's in a good place now. And then when he sent it back, there were 15,000 words missing. And I was like, are you <laughs> kidding me? 
I'm not writing them again. I'll, I'll do five <laughs> and I'll meet you halfway. I think I did that. He, it was 80,000 words. He cut 15, it ended up at like 71. So I was like, I'm not, do, I'm not, not doing those words. <laughs> those words are now gone. They will never be read by anybody. Wow. There's, um, there's a number of themes to the questions. Let's let's deal with, there's a couple of people who are heartlessly asking about writer's block. How do you deal with writer's block? This can be a question for a pair of you actually. And um, I'll, get, I'll, I'll credit the two uh, questions where I can find them. There's, there's a couple of them. So Beth, do you, do you ever get writer's block and how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think it comes in various guises. Um, sometimes it's sort of feeling like you've lost the love, I think for the story, which, you know, as we were saying, like when it's a long project like that, um, that is really hard uh, and it's really hard to get back. One of the things I find really helpful is having, I, particularly with the road trip actually, I really wrote to music um, and sometimes if I was kind of feeling the story slipping or I wasn't feeling like that kind of connection with it, I would put my road trip playlist on and go do something else. And often that music would kind of take me back to the feeling that I was trying to get to or, um, so I find, yeah, pl playlists are really helpful. And they're also really good during edits because they remind you of that like heady first draft phase where you think, God, this is amazing. I'm writing a brilliant book. <laughs> and then you, uh, then you, then you reread it as discussed and realize you haven't written a brilliant book yet. Um, yeah. So that, and, and also I, in terms of like when you often writer's block for me is a, if I'm midway through a project is a sign that something's wrong. Um, so it, like it might be that I'm forcing a character to do something that they just wouldn't do or I've not figured out what this person's secret is yet and so I mean for some of the road trip I hadn't figured out everybody's secrets yet and I was just finding myself typing people saying things like well you would think that wouldn't you <laughs> and I was thinking why what are you on about <laughs> and it was because I think somewhere in my head I, I, I had it you know it was it was just buried and I needed some separation and some time going over kind of sitting with the characters and I tend to the, it's weird the, the most productive thing to do is for me is leave is just g kind of drop it and go for a walk or take a couple of days off which feels like the last thing you want to do when you're on a deadline and your book you're stuck uh, because it's like I can't not work this is just exactly when I need to work because something's wrong but it's usually when I take my eye away from it that I sort of figure out what the problem is if that makes sense mm. I slightly different Writer's block is a weird one because I, because my job, my day job is writing for clients who pay money for that writing. It's it's kind of not in my head. So if I'm I'm always I've always got to be doing something writing wise. So I've always been kind of like I can't have writer's block because I can't go to this client and say unfortunately that ebook you have commissioned is not going to be delivered because I'm just not feeling it and um, <laughs> as much as I would like to. So I don't really get that so much. What I do get is what I said earlier when I, I get to a point where I'm like, this is wrong. So the, the project I started year before last, it was going to be a third book. I got 30,000 words through. The concept I thought was really good. And I still think the concept is good, but I don't think it's good for a book because the character was all so dislikable that you just couldn't get through it. And I found as a writer, I couldn't get through it. I got to a point where I was like, I can't write these people anymore. They're also because they were deliberately awful. Um, and in a say sitcom, you can do that because you can spend time, you can spend 25 minute bursts with terrible people. You can't spend, you can't spend 70, 80,000 words. With so I kind of just knocked, I, I got a third of the way through picked up again wrote a thousand words and I was like I'm not I can't do it there's there's no there's no continuing this what I do get is that in miniature so that I will get to a point where I'm like I'm not I'm not loving this so I'll stop and then I'll just leave it for a week or two and then I'll go back and do another glut and I I use this writing program called Scrivener and it gives you a daily word count which is really awful especially on days where there are like minus words so I went on it the other day and it was like, you've written minus 62 words. It's <laughs> <laughs> an achievement there. have been doing it for hours. This, um, question, this question came from Buseo and um, the whole writer's block thing. And I sense that because um, she's uh, currently writing herself. So uh, scared of rejection. Um, she's obviously not published yet. Uh, you said only one agent. How did you deal with that? And she put at the end, I'm terrified. <laughs> Oh, bless you. I so feel you. It's so scary putting yourself out there like that with with writing. And 
um yeah I mean you're talking to me on my publication day so I am really feeling that that particular feeling of sending a book out into the world and just hope, hoping that it connects with people um and that's what you're doing just like on a different you know a different point um so yeah I really feel you it is scary and I think the thing that I have found most helpful in terms of dealing with rejection or people not because you know your, your book won't be for everyone and um uh, if you're a natural people pleaser, which I am, then that's hard to deal with, but it won't be for everyone. And um, the thing that I find really helpful is the next, having the next project. So as long as you've kind of got another something that you believe in, that's your, you know, the, whether it's the next novel or something that you're working on, there's, I think it really helps to be able to say, okay, do you know what, maybe, okay, you didn't like this one, but they're going to love it. When I finish the next one, they're going to love it, you know? So if that rejection does come, um, that you you kind of, it's not like your whole heart was just in that project. Um, and the other thing to remember is that it's, I, everyone says it, but it is such a big part of the business and every writer has their story of, of all the people that turned them down or, you know, didn't, didn't like their book. Um, and it, there is a certain amount of persistence and it only takes like one yes, you know, there's, there's, you can have tons of no's and then there's that one person that's like, I loved it, I got it completely. I, I wanna sit down and chat to you about it and I think we can sell it to a publisher and that person is like, you know, they'll, they'll be out there. They're just, you just, you just need to find them. <laughs> yes, I'm getting so much love and so many love, lovely questions from the audience. Um... Jules came back regarding her um, uh, her question earlier about editing. She said, "I actually love the editing process. It's the first draft that she finds horrendous, which is that's a whole <laughs> different different thing." Um, Carla, uh, you are my go-to author when people ask for recommendations. Uh, so I'm isn't that a lovely thing to say? That's and so honestly, fine. thank how you. Amazing. So I'm wondering, who is your auto buy go-to author when recommending a book? Oh, great question. Um, As a bookseller, I need to know that um, your answer as well. <laughs> <laughs> so auto buy, I have a, probably a few auto buy authors. Um, Marion Keys is one. I just feel like she gets better with every book. Um, Grown Ups is her most recent one and is just like masterful. Um, and Helen Huang, who wrote The Kiss Quotient, um, which just stole my heart. I'm a big romance fan and um, that like from that but you know when you love a book so much that you're like I'm gonna read everything you ever write <laughs> you know yeah. I don't even need to see two one is plenty for me to know so um yeah she's got a new one coming up which is already pre-ordered mm. um yeah I'm trying to think and I, I would usually Sophie Kinsella I try and I, I kind of love a Sophie Kinsella for the holidays um and I mean, I would probably like I would always buy a David Nichols as well. I have a lot of auto buy authors. <laughs> I also love the phrase auto buy. It makes me so happy when somebody says that. If they say like you're an auto buy author, it's it's, it's such a like gesture of trust. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, Martin Eagles. Martin's been a regular watch. He, he lives over the far side of Wales, and uh, but he's been watching virtually all our events. Say hello, Martin. Uh, hi, Beth. I'm halfway through the road trip. Um, I did send it out maybe a touch early. So uh, there's a few people who ordered from us who maybe have got it there too early. So apologies. The benefits of ordering. <laughs> the, the benefits of ordering first. You're obviously very successful with, within the, um, the sort of contemporary fiction genre, but would you consider a change of genre, psychological thriller or um, some such? Oh, wow. Um, I feel like I write what I love to read at the moment and um, I definitely don't have that kind of, urge to go elsewhere but um also I don't in terms of psychological thrillers I don't think I could you know like that's a it's a really really different sort of I mean maybe I could but it's a vibe think... though isn't it it's like I can't even read a psychological thriller I don't know if I could ever <laughs> write it right. I, I get I, I'm not good with tension I've got no, to say no, if, no. if like if I don't know whether someone's going to die or something that I find that too stressful <laughs> so yeah. If I mean, maybe it would be less stressful as a writer because I, I would have the power to <laughs> make sure they didn't or did. <laughs> I read um, last last year we did an event with um, uh, Stu Turton, who wrote The Seven Death of Evelyn Hardcastle and The Devil in the Dark Water for, for the bookshop. Yeah. And um, The Devil in the Dark Water's got like big horror vibes to it. And Stu's a really good friend of mine. I, I was reading it. I was like, I'm reading it for the for the event, but I'm genuinely scared and 
you know, if it wasn't you, I'd put it down. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah I, I get this awful urge to like, just keep flicking on to make sure that everything's okay. Like yeah. I, do, I do like the comfort of knowing that I'm in safe hands and I'm probably gonna have a happy ending at the end. Yeah, it's not gonna be bad. <laughs> We've got five minutes. Um, there's a few questions that relate to the whole planning thing. Are you a planner or are you, and a phrase that was given in, the, in an event the other day, um, with Claire Pooley's event, are you a planner or a pantser? Which is, have you heard of that phrase? Which yeah. means sitting on the, on, on, the or, 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 or your pants or something, I don't know what it is, but um, <laughs> so yeah. I guess we all, but what, um, are you? I mean, you've obviously got a structure to uh, to involved in 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 the start. Do you know where it's going to finish, or do you just sort of wing it a little bit? Yeah, I'd say I'm kind of half and half. I sort of um, I I tend to start before I really know where it's going. Uh, like I'll have this sort of central idea, the central question, and and the characters, and then I just at a certain point get this itch where I'm like, I'm just going to try writing it down. I'm just going to try meeting these characters and see what happens. Um, and then after a certain amount of just seeing what happens, my head starts to get a bit full because I'm sort of thinking, oh, and I want that to happen. Oh, and, and I start to imagine scenes. And that's always a good sign. You know, we were, you know, kind of talking about how, you know, an idea is the a goer, ideally before writing 30,000 words of it. <laughs> um, and I can, if I'm so, sort of imagining future scenes, then that's usually a good sign. Um, and at about maybe about 30,000 words, I tend to write a kind of, brain dump plan which is just like nothing's joined up or in order it's just a load of things that I think will happen and then I tend not to look at it again and then I get to about 60,000 words and maybe do that process again and then don't look at that and then um yeah it's so it's I guess there is an element of kind of writing things down and I kind of have because I've I've got a sort of plan in my head but um sometimes they're just like little things to, to hang it on to, to get to, you know. You're not, you're not one of those people that has like the, the big sort of wall of post-it notes. No, I envy really. those people. Yeah, though. I know. Those... <laughs> I, I would love to be one of those people. It's, <laughs> it's a real time planning envy of knowing where the story's going to go before you've written yeah, it. It must be very comforting. Although oh, yeah. I also think for me, it would maybe, I worry that it would like take out the joy because a lot of the, that kind of joy of a day of writing where you think, I really didn't, know where I was going this morning when I sat down at my desk and I've ended up with a scene that I love and I had no idea that the characters were going to take me there like that kind of slightly magical writing yeah. feeling I worry that if I had all my post-its would I still would I still get that I don't know it's the spontaneous creative thing isn't there that sometimes yeah. the best idea doesn't come when you've sort of tried to put it in, a, in an audio it just yeah. comes but it, it obviously must do for other people work, I yeah. think for me if I post it noted Emma, Emma Capron came flying by the seat of your pants. Yes, that's what I was trying to say. That's it. That's it. So, um, I mean, I was interviewing Anne Cleves and uh, she she starts the day with a blank sheet of paper. No idea where, where it's going. Literally just starts writing and sees what happens. I mean, that is an extraordinary achievement. Um, we've only got two minutes left. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover off a rather lovely question from Carla. Uh, how has your life changed since becoming the most awesome and wholesome author with a big heart at the end oh what a lovely question thank you gala um how has my life changed i mean i get to do this for a job which is amazing like i it's such a, a privilege and i feel so lucky every day i sit down at this desk because writing used to be something that i squeezed in you know in on my commute or like in half an hour at the end of the day and now I get to give it all my attention um and that is I, yeah it's amazing it really is um it's it's strange having readers that's that's like a, a new and wonderful thing um and you know it's always amazing when it's so rewarding when someone connects with the book you know like my favorite thing to hear from people is that like it's cheered them up when they've had a bad day or you know it's it, and it's really it really makes it feel worthwhile when you've written a book that somebody says like oh it made me smile just when I would like had a crappy day at work or whatever it is like that that is a lovely warm feeling um but yeah on practical terms been able to get a dog that's been good <laughs> now that I work from home um so yeah that was pretty much the first thing when when I realized I could go full-time as a writer it's like now I can get a dog <laughs> <laughs> no you're not not just an author though you're an auto buy author <laughs> different isn't it 
<laughs> you have a feature for that on the bookshop website then just as soon as that author's got a new book it just goes straight to those people and you take oh i name. love that if you could <laughs> put in your auto by authors that's, that's, <laughs> the, that's the next that must be some function we can offer as well <laughs> <laughs> um, just so everyone knows, um, I have on the links there, I've put a link to Jamie's book um, in the chat function, which uh, was referenced earlier. I've also put a link to our YouTube channel um, where you'll be able to see this interview and the previous hundred interviews or so we've done. Um, I did. I overlooked Molly's question, which is not really a question. It's just a chat. Joining from L.A., I, I'd lovely to have an audience member from uh, the other side of America. I love your first two books, and I can't wait to read The Road Trip. Uh, have you ordered it from us? That's a long way to send it. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I especially love how you so deftly address so many real life issues in your books. And uh, they are so sweet and funny. So it's not really a question, just a statement. Oh, thank and you so much. And thank like you a lovely for way to from LA. What time is it there? <laughs> um, it's going to be lunchtime-ish. I'm so Okay, yeah. Yeah, is that right? Jamie, can I leave you just to say a quick closing comment about how lovely Beth's books are? Yes, they're all very lovely, and I really <laughs> enjoyed the road trip. You really set you up there. You he did set me up there. Nice I was like, oh my God, what am I going to say? Um, <laughs> I yeah, I would thoroughly recommend everyone buy it. It's funny. Uh, it's great for this kind of time of year, getting into summer, and after a year in which we've all not been able to go anywhere, it's quite a tonic to read a book in which people do go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh once again huge congratulations on the publication of the road trip it's, it's been a really nice way to spend the evening chatting to you and i hope Thank the book does guys. incredibly well which i'm sure it will and please buy your copies from from our bookshop in train well, well thank you so much for having me it's been wonderful no it's been an absolute honor thank you beth thank you jamie and um our next event tomorrow is war uh, war trials by will yates i don't know if this is the right audience for that uh, and then we've got Maggie Shipstead on uh, Tuesday with Great Circle. And then probably the most relevant next event for our customers tonight, Elizabeth McNeil, Circus of Wonders. That's probably right up your street. There's a thriller on with Tom Bradby, if, uh, but I don't know if Beth, you're not into your thrillers, or Jamie. No. <laughs> the odd like one, the odd one, as long as they're not too scary. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and there's loads of other events in the pipe pipeline, which um, I'm in the middle of long chats with publishers and stuff at the moment. So... One last thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. Jamie, once again, thank you. Audience, thank you so much for joining us. And apologies to all those questions that I didn't get through. Carla, Donna, Gemma, Eleanor, um, another Gemma there. So thank you so much. And um, we'll see you all very soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.